it almost sounds like you're describing the Republican Party itself. And, and I, I think that's probably an instructive comparison because what we have seen there is a death spiral. You have moderates driven out. You have open-minded or just brave people willing to speak up driven out and a party that has grown so extreme that it has become a threat to democracy. Do you see that happening to mainstream evangelical churches? I'm Ken Harbaugh. What could possibly go wrong? This is Burn the Boats, a show about making tough calls in tough times. America today faces a critical test. Our democracy is under threat. But good people are rising to the challenge. Now is the time to go all in. Now we burn the boats. My guest today is Kristen Cobes Dumay, a professor of history and gender studies at Calvin University. Her book, Jesus and John Wayne, reveals how evangelicals have worked to replace the Jesus of the Gospels with an idol of rugged masculinity and Christian nationalism. Kristen, welcome to Burn the Boats. Thank you for having me. I'd love to start with an understanding of terms, and I'm going to ask you to define evangelical Christian, which I know is a trap because even though the Association of, uh, of Evangelicals has a definition which you cite, you're the first to acknowledge that that does not match reality. So who are we talking about when we say evangelicals? Yeah, so I don't offer a very precise definition. I don't try to define evangelicals as much as I try to describe them. And so you're right, the National Association of Evangelicals will offer a theological description of its um, a biblicism, taking the Bible seriously, conversionism, the born-again experience, and crucicentrism, the centrality of the cross of Christ, and then activism. Right, That's kind of their official definition, and I'd plan to use that. That's what most scholars do. And, and then I started looking at history and realizing that we really needed to understand evangelicalism more as a as a historical and cultural movement and um, as a series of networks and in many ways as a consumer culture. So to be an evangelical is to attend an evangelical church, absolutely, to listen to Christian music, Christian radio, absolutely, to shop at Christian bookstores, to read Christian publishing. If you participate in this culture, you are shaped by these values. And um, and that's really the evangelicalism that I'm studying as a cultural historian. These days, it seems like that historical slash cultural definition is incomplete. And, and it kind of glosses over the the biblical or scriptural or faith based definition. But what it's really missing is the political element. Is that a, a fair critique? I mean, politics now seems to define the evangelical movement more than faith itself. Exactly. So, you know, if you're just looking at um, theological doctrines of evangelicalism, you know, by the standard definition, what you'll find is the majority of black Protestants also check those boxes. But the majority of black Protestants, vast majority who can check all those boxes theologically do not identify as evangelical, because it's very clear to them that there's a whole lot more to evangelical than just the theology, and that you can believe all those things. But if you don't hold the same political views, if you you, um, you know, you, you likely aren't attending the same churches. You likely aren't reading the same books. So why would we insist on grouping those together? And if you look at this uh, historical cultural movement, you can see that politics very much has come to define kind of the boundaries of who is accepted and who is not accepted in these spaces. It seems to me that it's done more than define the boundaries, it is, it has moved the boundaries. It has shifted the Overton window. We recently had Angela Denker on and, and she made this observation, which I'd love your reaction to because I hadn't heard it before and it, it kind of shook me. She said that when faith conflicts with politics these days, people leave behind their faith. They identify oh, more yes. with their political tribe than their theological tribe. 
That is very true. And so, um, but they will tell themselves that they are holding their political views because of their faith, because it is God's truth, because God's word dictates it. But they're reading the scriptures, they're approaching their theology, they're forming their theology already with this political cultural lens. So that's absolutely correct. One of the things your book did for me was challenge this idea that the evangelical vote for Trump was an accommodation or a compromise or somehow strategic politically. You argue that's not really the case. And and I'm not going to put words in your mouth. I'll just read this section of the book and, and would love your your thoughts on it. Evangelical support for Trump was no aberration, nor was it merely a pragmatic choice. It was rather the culmination of evangelicals' embrace of militant masculinity, an ideology that enshrines patriarchal authority and condones the callous display of power at home and abroad. Trump isn't a compromise candidate. He's their prophet. Yes, uh, I do make that claim. And I'd started looking into researching the connections between evangelical conceptions of masculinity and militarism and aggression more than 15 years ago. And so I'd kind of been tracking this. And I'd also seen how many of the evangelical men most promoting this uh, kind of aggressive masculine ideal became implicated in scandal in abuse of power, in sexual abuse. And over and over again, I saw this pattern emerge and I saw evangelical communities end up defending perpetrators, defending abusers and ostracizing victims. And and the ends justifies the means and this very culture wars mentality of us versus them, zero sum game. I just saw that over and over again. So when we got to the fall of 2016, particularly October, the release of the Access Hollywood video, and the question that everybody was asking is, how can evangelicals betray their values to vote for a man like Donald Trump? Right then I knew that was the wrong question. This was not a betrayal. We needed to understand, you know, family values evangelicals always at the heart of family values politics has been the assertion of white patriarchal power. And as soon as you put that at the center, a lot of these other things fall into place. I know the Access Hollywood tape keeps coming up again and again. And and you're right that the question we were asking about evangelical support was the the wrong one. And, And I think that was really highlighted at the CNN town hall when we saw his mockery once again of an abuse victim, his repeated shaming of someone he abused, cheered by that crowd, which just is an exclamation point on this idea that he's he's not a pragmatic choice. He's not that uh, they don't rationalize their support for him. They they adore him. Yeah, that. um you know, I didn't see a lot of the kind of the theory was that they're holding their noses to vote for Donald Trump, right? I was watching very closely and I didn't see a lot of nose holding there. Instead, I, I saw a lot of um, kind of praising this. Uh, he was their ultimate fighting champion, right? He was he was going to do what needed to be done precisely because he was unrestrained by traditional Christian virtue, like humility and gentleness and and meekness, or you know we could even talk honesty, right? That was that was precisely what they loved about him, and yes, and we see how he was. Um, you know, he confessed to assaulting women and bragged about it and repeatedly and. What I knew from researching this history is that evangelicals too, you know, these family values evangelicals who put so much emphasis on sexual purity and the purity of women over and over again, when evangelical men with power, with when pastors and leaders abuse women, sexually assault women, even young girls over and over again, they end up defending the perpetrators 
and blaming and shaming the victim. In fact, while uh, the CNN town hall was going on, I was just wrapping up a documentary film shoot with a couple of survivors in uh, evangelicalism, sex abuse survivors who are just poured out these harrowing stories of what it was like, not just to be abused by pastors, but also then absolutely blamed and shamed by their own churches. You talk about traditional Christian virtue and its conflict with the the actual behavior of leaders within the church. But I get the sense that traditional Christian virtue is itself being redefined to maybe mitigate that conflict. When you look at when you look at the the imagery of Christ in in modern evangelical churches today, the way they talk about him as a vengeful warrior Christ, your words, that's not a traditional depiction of Jesus at all. And I would imagine that reframing is very useful politically. Exactly, exactly. You know, uh, evangelicals self-identify first and foremost as Bible-believing Christians. That's that's how they advertise who they are, core of their identity. And yet, when I look at the last half century or so of conservative white evangelicalism, it's very interesting to see in which cases you know, they hold on to this very rigid sense of plain reading of the scripture and biblical literalism on, on things like uh, sexuality, sexual morality of a certain sort and, uh, and submission of women. But there are a whole lot of other Bible passages about, uh, you know, giving your money to the poor, about welcoming the stranger, about loving your enemies and turning the other cheek. And there's all kinds of convoluted reasoning that's done around those passages to say those don't actually apply to us today, right? Now, all, all Christians do this to a certain extent. All religious folks who have, you know, a kind of sacred text are going to be um, kind of interpreting in different ways. But evangelicals tend to be much less aware of the lenses that they're bringing to scriptures and absolutely convinced that there is no interpretation. They are simply receiving God's word and doing it. And so I will say that, um, you know, the title, subtitle of my book, How White Evangelicals Corrupted a Faith and Fractured a Nation, that corrupted a, a faith uh, phrase is not a historical claim. Right? There's there's actually no such thing as you know corrupting a faith historically. There's a bit of a normative claim there. And although the book is a work of history, that is me talking directly to conservative evangelicals for just a moment and saying, you know, you say this about yourselves. Take another look, right? Take another look at the scriptures. Take another look at these values. Take another look at the figure of Jesus Christ, how you've painted him, and then look at that text again and, uh, and you know, see how they match up or see how they don't. I'd love to hear some some stories about the reactions to your to your book. I make a point of reading both the five star and the one star reviews. And the one star reviews, um, if they weren't so menacing, would I, I don't know, they'd be kind of funny. I, you get a sense of who is writing those, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I, I will say that uh, 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 some of the uh, critiques, uh, at least, uh, it seems to me, kind of prove the point. Uh, yeah. You know, when I <laughs> I, I didn't want to I didn't want to say it, but it's like it's angry yeah. white dudes with a bunch of guns, right? Really angry. Yes. Uh, you know, when I wrote this book, I'm a historian. I, I'm a historian. I teach at a Christian university. I, um, I wrote this book as I was writing it. I, I actually didn't give a whole lot of thought to how it would be received, except I knew that it had to be absolutely, um, um, vetted, well evidenced. I knew that I knew it would be a little controversial. So I, I just absolutely s never went beyond my evidence, right? There's 30 some pages of footnotes uh, or endnotes. And um, you sent it out to, you know, more, like a dozen other scholars 
experts to um, assess before it even went into publication. Uh, and then it had a thorough legal review, right? So it's very well vetted. And I knew it would need to be because I knew that it was going to be provocative in certain spaces. Uh, I expected some pushback. Um, and, and there has been some from exactly who you would expect. What I didn't actually expect, though, I have to say, is how enthusiastically this book would be received in white evangelical spaces. I did not anticipate that. I have heard from so many because, I mean, the thing is about evangelicalism, and even if you look at, you know, white evangelicalism, you have that kind of notorious 81%, you know, who voted for Donald Trump. That's a lot. And that's a really important part of uh, his base and a very uh, powerful faction of the Republican Party. Very significant. Still, that leaves 19% of white evangelicals who did not, right? And then you've got some evangelicals kind of right on the edge, right in the middle. And it's many of those who read the book and said, this is absolutely true. And so like within two days of the book's publication, I started getting letters back from readers and people assume I get a ton of hate mail and I get almost none, but I have gotten hundreds by now, probably a couple of thousand of messages, letters uh, from evangelicals themselves saying, this is the story of my life. And thank you for helping me to see. Is there anything they can do to push back within their communities or are their numbers so small and their, their opponents so militant? And I'll go back to that word again, menacing, which is Never a word you should be using to describe a Christian congregation, but you document it. Angela Danker documented it. Uh, you know, we've talked to a few people who talk about that feeling of of, of menace. Angela uses the phrase fear-based Christianity. Yeah. In that environment, if you read a book like Jesus and John Wayne and it speaks to you, what do you do? Yeah. I love that you're connecting it to Angela's work because uh, her book, Red State Christians, came out uh, almost a year before Jesus and John Wayne or several months before. And so she had actually reached out to me and we connected um, before the release of both of our books because we saw we were we were describing some of the same um, patterns. And uh, so, yes, <laughs> what can evangelicals do? What I have seen and what I document in the book, too, in the last chapters is a number of white evangelicals, conservative white evangelicals who have taken courageous stands in their churches, in their communities against this um, militancy, against this uh, in terms of politics, uh, you know, anti-democratic um, impulses, um, standing up for victims of abuse. Yes. And those stories are um inspiring, but they are also distressing because what happens time and again is those are the folks who are then pushed out of their organizations, out of their churches. If it's a pastor, they're no longer pastoring that church. If it's a Christian school teacher, Christian college professor, often they're the ones without a job at the end of the day. And so what I see is a lot of resistance and even some change, not a, a lot, but certainly some on the individual level. But if I look at evangelical institutions, it's a less hopeful situation. That's where you see the, the powers are able to, you know, donors, constituents, um, leaders are able to keep people quiet and maintain the status quo. I mean, I was talking with somebody in a Christian media industry um, not long ago, interviewing them for my next book. And they told me something that, that just rang absolutely true. And they said kind of the, the, um, um, inside memo here that we get is you don't have to agree with this, like right wing Trump politics and all. You just can't publicly disagree. And I think that very well describes the dynamic. So at the individual level, you can dissent. But if you're trying to challenge the system, that's going to be trouble. It almost sounds like you're describing the Republican Party itself. And, and yes. I, I think that's probably an instructive comparison because what yes. we have seen there is a death spiral. You yes. have moderates driven out. You have open-minded or just brave people willing to speak up driven out and a party that has grown so extreme that it has become a threat to democracy. Do you see yes. that happening to mainstream evangelical churches? 
Yeah, you know, I actually use that comparison. Uh, I look at the book, How Democracies Die, right, by um, Ziblatt and Levitsky. And yep. and they talk about the, uh, you know, what happens, because you're going to have wannabe authoritarian leaders um, rise up all, all the time. You do. Historically speaking, you can see this. But then they ask the question, you know, what, what actually makes it possible for one of these wannabe authoritarians to seize power? And the key thing there is that the the political parties do not play their necessary role of gatekeeping. That you've got political party leaders who think, you know what, we can use this. We can use this to our advantage. We can harness this to our political advantage. And they see there's like a window in which you can suppress this uh, this kind of reactionary element but if you let things get too far you lose the power to do this and, and this is kind of the the story of of uh, you know reactionary populism and i see you could apply that same um metric to white evangelicalism and one of the things i trace in my book is the complicity of more respectable moderate evangelicals uh in this reactionary movement, that many people, when it came to patriarchy, when it came to racism, when it came to some of these really more extreme reactionary elements inside evangelicalism that I trace and this, this you know, militancy, a lot of the moderates would still say, at the end of the day, this is my brother in Christ. So they're going to like kick out anybody who moves more progressive on LGBTQ or kick out anybody who, who rejects kind of this patriarchy, female submission model, and they're no longer well Welcome in their gospel coalition, but anybody to the right was kind of, you know, tolerated or even platformed and seen as one of us against the left, against, you know, the secular um, threat. And over years, over decades, we see where that has led us, which is now uh, those folks who thought they controlled evangelicalism, the respectable evangelicals, the elites, they are back on their heels and they are uh, realizing that they actually don't have power over the movement. In America today, we cannot talk about the the patriarchal nature of that movement. We cannot talk about the militancy of today's evangelical church without talking about guns. And it's striking to me how that has become a, a defining feature of evangelicals today. And I'll, I'll get us started by just reading back to you one of your observations about this within the church. Uh, writers on evangelical masculinity have long celebrated the role guns play in forging Christian manhood, from toy guns in childhood to real firearms, gifted in initiation ceremonies, guilty on both counts, played with them as a kid, grew up in a, in a very religious family. My graduation present was a nine millimeter. Guns are seen to cultivate authentic, God-given masculinity. A 2017 survey revealed that 41% of white evangelicals own guns, a number higher than members of any other faith group. Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> you know, I, I think it's it's possible to to separate. Like you can, I bought my my son a BB gun for Christmas, right? Okay, <laughs> so I'll just put that out there. Um, he he likes to hunt and he plans to um, to go into the military, right? So uh, you know, there are ways to. It, it's not an all or nothing. But in, in white evangelicalism, conservative evangelicalism, you do see this, this, um, I mean, what, what some evangelicals themselves will call almost an idolatry here of, uh, not just, um, you know, thinking that guns are okay for, you know, limited purposes, but really it, it's, it's rooted, it, it's connected to their core identity. And that guns are necessary as um, as a way to fight and as a way to protect your family. Um, but then that is, I mean, realistically, very, very, very few families, particularly white middle class families, are in, um, you know, kind of dire threat where a firearm is going to um, bring them protection, right? But this is the rhetoric then that justifies the... Um, um, this kind of 
if you understand that the world is against you and if you believe that and if you continue to leaders like stoke this fear, right, then you are going to see a threat around every corner. Like that is by design and it's an excellent way for leaders to consolidate power. If you convince people that they are under siege, that they owe you loyalty, they're going to give you money and, um, you know, and you're going to be able to demand sacrifice from them. This is how that system works. In the case of firearms, then, you know, it, it really is um, uh, aggression is linked to this identity of what it is to be protector, even if there is no actual threat that a firearm can protect one from. And that is the framework that supersedes anything such as, you know, do not murder or, um, you know, of turning the other cheek, of loving your enemies, of offering yourself in sacrificial love, like all of this in, in Christian history, there is a long tradition of pacifism, a tradition of nonviolence. And what we see happening is like, you can't even surface that. And, and there, there are no, there's no space anymore for actual theology, for theological conversations, for people to come together as people of faith and say, what does our scripture teach us? Because the politics trumps everything. And, um, you know, and it's, it's in this case, one that is arguably really against much of Christian history and core teachings of the Christian scriptures, but it doesn't matter. Thanks for watching, everyone. We've got a quick message from our show sponsor. But first, I've got a favor to ask. Growing a show like Burn the Boats depends on you. There was a time when thoughtful interviews with interesting guests could stand on their own. But these days, the algorithm is everything. The recommendations that show up in the feeds of YouTube viewers and podcast listeners depend on the reviews that shows like this get. So please give us a thumbs up. Follow this channel. And if you're up for it, please consider clicking on the link to the podcast page and leaving us a five-star review. It makes a huge difference. Thanks. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. I know asking for help can be hard, but BetterHelp does more than anyone I can think of to make therapy accessible to anyone. And it's not just about dealing with trauma. Therapy is for everyone. These are stressful times all around. BetterHelp can give you the tools to find more balance in your life so you can keep supporting others without leaving yourself behind. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. It's helpful for learning positive coping skills and how to set boundaries, and generally speaking, how to become the best version of yourself. What you're going through matters. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Find more balance with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Boats today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Boats boats. This is sponsored by Lomi. I have a big family and that means there's usually a lot of trash left over by the time the week comes to an end. And frankly, I used to feel a bit guilty about this, but then I got a Lomi. Now that I have a Lomi, it's changed the way I think about food waste. Lomi transforms my garbage into gold at the push of a button. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns food scraps to dirt in under four hours. Now, I love composting. Plus, it's made cooking at home even more fun. There's no food rotting in my garbage. And thanks to Lomi, I don't have to take out the trash nearly as often. And it's a hassle-free, mess-free experience. No more leaking bags. Here's something cool, too. I turn my waste into nutrient-rich dirt that I can feed to my plants, lawn, or garden. That means it's not going to landfills. I get to help the environment and make my life easier. All my food scraps, plant clippings, and even those leftovers I forgot in the back of the fridge go back into my garden, helping me grow more nutritious food right in my backyard. Food waste makes up a huge portion of our personal carbon footprint. By reducing the amount of food I send to a landfill, 
I'm helping do my part for the planet while also feeding my garden. Whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact or just grow a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash boats and use promo code boats to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash boats and use promo code boats at checkout. Thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. Breathe some life into your own backyard with FastGrowingTrees.com this spring. From shade to fresh fruit to privacy to natural beauty, let FastGrowingTrees.com help you plant your dream garden with their expert advice and fast, reliable shipping. FastGrowingTrees.com's plant experts curate thousands of easy-to-grow plant, shrub, and tree varieties for your unique climate. Meyer lemons to evergreens and everything in between. Happy plants, happy home, right? But sometimes it's hard to know which plants will do best. No problem, because with FastGrowingTrees.com, you get customized recommendations based on your specific needs. Plus, their plant experts are always available to help keep your plants growing healthy through the season and beyond. No more waiting in long lines and hauling heavy plants around. With FastGrowingTrees.com, you order online, and your plants arrive at your door in just a few days. I love fast growing trees because I found the perfect Cleveland pear tree I was looking for at a great price. And you will too. And with fast growing trees 30 day alive and thrive guarantee, you know everything will look great fresh out of the box. Join over 1.5 million happy fast growing trees customers. Go to fastgrowingtrees.com slash boats now to get 15% off your entire order. Get 15% off your order at fastgrowingtrees.com slash boats. That idolization of firearms has extended to the people who embody gun culture. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of some of these AI generated images that are coming out of Jesus wielding Uzis. Uh, and <laughs> evangelicals seem, not all of them, but the fact that people are making those things and celebrating them is, is, just, is just weird. And then you look at, and this is me approaching this from a, a veteran's perspective, the idolization of military people who actually betray every martial virtue but yes. in doing that have become heroes of the evangelical right. I'm thinking yes. about folks like Eddie Gallagher, uh, war criminal, um, murderer, but the evangelical right now platforms him and he speaks from the pulpit. I bet if, if Lieutenant Callie had, had led the My Lai massacre today, he'd be on the, the speaking yeah. circuit in evangelical yes. churches. Yes. Yeah. And you see that the popularity of, of somebody like Kyle Rittenhouse, too, in these spaces. Um, so, so, yes, what we have now is an ideology and kind of politics that's um, blended with you know a certain masculine ideal, a militancy that has that stands in that that replaces kind of traditional Christian teachings. What you don't hear in these spaces is any meaningful discussion of the virtues. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm asked by evangelicals. Uh, I, I go to a lot of evangelical churches and, and speak at evangelical colleges. And sometimes I'll have a, a white evangelical man, you know, say, okay, well, what should a Christian man do? What should a Christian man be? Because you give us the better Christian masculinity. And yeah, as a historian of gender, I can always say, okay, first of all, there are always many masculinities, right? Even the, the question that there is one way to be a Christian man, that all men should fit exactly that mold, right? That, that it, it's just, it's, it's the wrong question. That said, like, if you really want to push me, I'm a historian. I, I don't, uh, you know, usually go there. I don't go there in the book, but I don't know. As a Christian, I would say maybe start with the fruit of the spirit. You know, what does it mean to be a Christian? Not just man, but there's not a lot in the, in the Bible, actually, that's this is just for the men. This is just for the ladies, right? Very little actually is. But what does it mean to follow Christ? That's put very clearly. And in the fruit of the spirit, if you have the spirit of, of Christ right in you, you're going to see the evidence in kindness, gentleness, meekness, right? Self-control. 
these are the things that show that you are in Christ. I'm like, I don't know. Just take those things and apply them to what does it mean to be a man, right? You know, that works too, but those are exactly the, you know, you don't hear anything about these virtues. You don't hear anything about traditional Christian teachings on discipleship. Instead, all of that has just been swept away for this aggression, this militancy, and that is called Christian. And so many people are are embracing that uncritically so that there's no space for actual Christian teachings to disrupt that. Well, it could be argued that Jesus himself was was a, a an early example of a of a feminist. He he gave the women of his early church the purse strings uh, to to manage the the finances. And I bet if evangelicals today confronted the historical Jesus, there would be a real reckoning. He wasn't American. He wasn't blonde. He was the the child of uh, of migrants. Does that ever come up? Uh, progressives love to throw those those facts in the, in the uh, conversation, but no, that that it, it doesn't really disrupt. And and I should note that just just this week, a, a sociological study came out that that showed just how much our preconceptions shape our religious belief. Right, what you what you brought up before, and our prior commitments, our politics, our values. And so, this isn't just conservative white evangelicals who do this, right? Each of us, you know, if we are a person of faith or a person of the Christian faith or other faiths, you know, we tend to be drawn to religious traditions or interpretations in those traditions that make us feel good about ourselves, that confirm our, our, our biases or our, um, our values, right? So, so everybody does that. Um, but many people are, are at least more aware of the fact that they do that. And what evangelicals, where they are different from many other traditions, is their cultural dominance, right? Their, 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 um, numbers, the political power that they wield, but also that they have created this vast kind of subculture. And if you're an evangelical, and I say the evangelical subculture, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. If you're not, like I use that phrase in the book, except uh, in a draft, it's not in the book because when I put it in the in um, a chapter, my editor, who's from completely outside this world, <clears throat> just marked that <clears throat> and said, you know, I don't know what these words mean, the evangelical subculture, right? I was like, okay, take it out and let me let me show, don't tell. And uh, but the truth is, like it's invisible to people on the outside what the evangelical subculture is, is, you know, books that sell in the tens of millions of copies, Christian radio, right? Focus on the family, playing like eight hours a day in people's homes. So they have this um, distribution system and able to really shape the worldview there, you know, in their words, of million, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people in this country and increasingly globally as well, right? And so that's what's different here. Everybody has like their own values. Everybody has biases. Everybody thinks that theirs are right and usually has like a, a religious or strong ethical reason for saying so. But evangelicals are able to control their narrative so powerfully and turn that to political um um, and really mobilize politically around that in a way that is very difficult to disrupt, very difficult even to to complicate, to nuance, to have any conversation. If you challenge it, you are clearly not on God's side. You're evil. When you talk about the cultural dominance of of evangelical Christians, you, you probably have to acknowledge that they wouldn't see it that way. They feel like they are under assault from all sides. And if there's one one Christly virtue that they seem to embrace, it's the idea of the, the blessedness of the persecuted, right? They love that persecution complex. They retreat to their bunker and and every Sunday talk about how they are being attacked. Am I wrong? Uh, yeah, so that that's definitely a motif here, a persecution narrative. And um, 
but they don't necessarily see themselves as blessed. They get really angry about that. Although it does, you know, it does signify that they're God's chosen, that they're, so anything that they do that makes people mad is kind of, see, told you, you know, the, the world will hate us, right? But, um, and so that, that kind of inoculates them against any legitimate critique. But this, this persecution narrative, um, one of the kind of crystallizing moments for me in my research when I, when I, uh, it w- was around this issue. And it was actually as I was r- researching this strange phenomenon after 9-11 and the years after 9-11 in, in the evangelical subculture of these uh, ex-Muslim terrorists who are taking the Christian speaking circuit by storm all over the place. These former Muslim terrorists who um were, you know, killing Christians and then got converted, not just to Christianity, but to evangelicalism. And now they're going all around and telling other um, evangelicals just how dangerous um, Muslims are, right? Turns out all these guys were frauds, frauds. total yeah. frauds, made this, you know, their backstory up, like ridiculous, ridiculously so exposed. And I, I came across these guys first because one of them came to my Christian college, and my colleague, fellow historian who happens to specialize in Ottoman history and knew a thing or two about Islam, within five minutes of attending this guy's talk, he's like, this makes no sense. These words don't exist. He's just, he's making stuff up. And so this guy was sponsored, supported by Focus on the Family, right? This is how this works. These guys are all over Focus on the Family, CBN, like all over. And so my colleague actually calls and gets through and talks to the president of focus on the family. And it turns out they knew he was a fraud and kept putting this out there, right? And so that's when this clicked for me, that the fear is real on the part of ordinary evangelicals, ordinary Christians. There is a lot of fear in those spaces, but it is also a manufactured fear, right? Um, manufacturing this threat. And I saw that in the case of those ex-Muslim terrorists. I saw it in the case of Mark Driscoll and his Mars Hill Church, right? very crass, militaristic um, pastor, went down in dis- disgrace, although he's now pastoring another church. And, um, but he loved this militaristic language. He would be flanked on both sides by security guards when he preached, always trying to drum up this sense of threat, imminent threat. Why he could demand sacrifice, loyalty, money from all of his, um, followers. And that's when I, I clicked for me. The fears were real, but it is manufactured. And rather than militancy being kind of the logical response of feeling threatened, which was what the narrative was in in uh, 2016, right? Evangelicals are just so threatened, their religious liberties. And, and so what choice did they have but to run into the arms of somebody like Donald Trump? I realized, no, we have to flip that script. More often than not, it's evangelical leaders who are stoking fears, manufacturing fears so that they consolidate, they can consolidate their own power. What is so ironic and frustrating about the, the co-option of those anti-Islamic tropes is that post 9-11, the whole narrative coming from the right was that Islam was a, was a violent religion that it was in, inherently drawn to that and now you see the the Christian evangelical church going down that path for real and yet still scapegoating muslims there's this passage from from your book and i trust your your research on it you say that white evangelicals believe that christians in america face more discrimination than muslims yes. if ever yes. there was a symptom of a bunker mentality. That's it. Exactly. And yet this is exactly what you will run into in in these spaces. They absolutely believe that. And the books that they are writing and the books that they are reading are telling them this over and over again. Christian radio, right? And, and now they're telling you, you have to pull your kids out of Christian schools. You have to homeschool your kids because the culture is against you. The world is against you, right? Nobody respects you and, and, and people are going to denigrate you and people are going to corrupt your children. Like this rhetoric is just pervasive in many of these spaces. And it's really hard to push back against because for, for many people, they are utterly convinced. That, and, and I should say that, right, I'm talking about inside these Christian spaces, Christian media, but um, it's, it's also um, very much in the secular 
conservative spaces, and I would say secular with kind of air quotes, because there's not a clear division between, say, Fox News and right-wing Christianity. It's um, there, There's a lot of overlap there, but these messages are being reinforced in those more secular media spaces, as well as inside their church spaces. You've talked a lot about Christian media and the the separate culture it has created, the books, the radio stations. But there is a massive economic component to that. There's there's even evangelical cell phone networks. Can you talk about the business of evangelical Christianity? Oh, so much money, so much money involved. And, and part of this is because, um, uh, I mean, people like to make money. <laughs> Uh, evangelicals are always about evangelism, right? Spread the word, spread the word. And so, uh, there, there's a kind of myth that evangelicals are anti-modern and historians have been trying to blow that up for, for, for generations now because evangelicals were always like at the cusp of whatever modern technology there was. Radios new, they are, they are on the airwaves right there because you can preach there. You can spread your news, you, you, the good news of the gospel. Um, and, and then, um, you know, Christian publishing and, and, and digital media and all of this, right? Um, so they are motivated to spread their message and to build their um, communities. And the more you, um, the, the bigger your faith community grows, the bigger your market. And these are, you know, these are largely not nonprofit enterprises. There is a ton of money being made because if you convince people that secular products but are- But often non-taxed, right? <laughs> okay, also that, right? Yes, very tricky here. Um, but in some of these businesses, like so the publishing arm of the SBC, Lifeway Christian Books, you know, massive book sales. Here too, like if you aren't in those spaces, you're oblivious to just how powerful this is. Um, another another uh, kind of disconnect with my editor when I was writing this book was he called into question some of my publication numbers, you know, literally tens of millions of copies of these books sold. And he just like flagged that and said, you know, this, this can't be accurate. You need to know publishers always inflate this. Where did you get these numbers? And I, and I pointed him to the, the footnote. I was like, well, this is, this was in the New York Times, but my bad. I'll go back and see what I can find. He's like, oh, wait, never mind. If it's in the New York Times, it has been vetted. <laughs> so the stands, right? This is accurate. But the thing is, none of these books, almost none of them make the New York Times bestseller list because that's a curated list and they know that their readers are not going to be going and reading the latest prophecy book. But the money is so big. So that, um, now, you know, what's their motivation? Is it just to fleece people? Is this just grift? There's a lot of grift. There's also true believers involved. It's, it's all of it, which is why it is so hard to disrupt. And so for, you know, more progressive Christians who ask me, what can we do here? I'm like, well, the battleground is, popular media. But you're going to be at a huge disadvantage because the thing about progressive Christians is they aren't so scared of the secular. They think they can learn things from people of other faith traditions. They don't have to hunker down and protect, um, which may be a, a virtue, may may not, depends on your interpretation. But it, what, what it does mean is there's not going to be a massive market, right? So that means that the, the Christian products that are out there are largely playing to that right-wing market. And as long as you can tap that, you're going to be successful. If you try to move it over here, good luck trying to run a business. Something about that economic model entwined with spreading the gospel has has always confused me, which is that evangelicalism has become a global phenomenon, but it is so tied to nationalism in this country. How do we reconcile that? How does a nationalistic, xenophobic movement go global? <laughs> that is a really great question, and I can't fully explain it, but but I can describe what you're talking about. Uh, because you're right, there, there's something within Christianity and evangelicalism that spread the good news that is universalist, right? That all people, national borders do not matter, go out into all the nations and preach the gospel, right? Those are the instructions that evangelicals do. They have mission organizations. All of these big evangelical ministries have global arms. Christian radio is, is a really big deal in, in Christian television in Africa. And Christian publishing dominates 
uh, ev- white evangelical American um, publishing dominates markets, Christian markets like in Brazil. Um, so, so it is global. And yet what is being exported is this nationalistic understanding of Christianity so that you have these kind of allies between um, right-wing Christians in Hungary, even in, you know, Putin's Russia, in Brazil with Bolsonaro. And I'm hearing from people around the world, other countries um, across the globe that are um, this is resonating and it's resonating. I don't know. We could, we could try to explain it in terms of kind of a, a push against globalism, a, a, you know, seeking kind of community and meaning and purpose. And then we just have to also look that this is the Christianity that is being fed to them over and over and over again. And it's often also linked with prosperity gospel teachings, yeah. right? So this, it, it's wrapped up with you believe this, you participate in this and God. God is going to bless you. God is going to bless you in your place. And so so somehow this still works. You can uphold your national borders, think that, you know, America first, 100%, but then see, find common cause with the people who are saying Hungary first and Russia first, and somehow think this is all going to um, um, work out okay. And the um, kind of truce is based on an embrace of traditionalism, of authoritarian leadership, uh, you know, the the um, punishment of um, LGBTQ folks, right? Enforcement of patriarchy. These are the things that are holding this in common. And I guess the idea is that, uh, you know, everybody's going to stay in their in their areas and, and not try to assert power over the other. But it seems pretty short sighted. But that's that's what's working right now in those spaces. Yeah. Speaking of the the, the spread of evangelicalism, uh, your Spanish language edition uh, recently came out, and I thought the cover was was incredible. I mean, the American edition has that subtle relief of the guns crossed in the middle yeah. of yeah. the cross. The the Spanish language edition is literally Christ nailed to guns. I mean, it's yes. it's it's, it's in face. Did that? Yes. Did, did you sign off on that? <laughs> no, I mean I signed off on uh, the rights, and then they said, "Oh, here's the title, or here's the cover." I was like, "Oh, it it was it, it did take my breath away when I saw it. I it was phenomenal, and so uh, I, I, I had to sit on that for a while. They wanted to release it when the when um, when the book released, uh, so." It, yeah, it is, it is a stunning cover. And, and I will say, I mean, I, I have been, I had to finally tell the Spanish publisher, I, I, I can't do all these interviews anymore. I was doing one or two a day and it just seemed indefinite for, for weeks. And so now they've, you know, I, they say, okay, so they're just bringing some big ones, but there's such an interest in Spain. And, um, and the Spanish edition also goes, um, is, is available throughout Latin America too, right? But in Spain, and I was thinking more of the Latin American audience, but, um, in Spain, they're seeing the rise of, of right-wing evangelicalism too. Um, it's out in Portuguese in, um, uh, so available in Brazil at the request of Brazilian evangelicals who see absolutely these same patterns taking hold in Brazil. So it is, um, it's actually, daunting, chilling even, to see how this book is, which is really about conservative white evangelicals in the United States. I'm an American historian, how much it is resonating with people around the world right now in ways that that should be alarming. Last question, and it's a total non sequitur, but something you said in a recent interview stuck with me. You're a Calvinist. And you said that Calvinists <laughs> see sin in structures. I have an idea of what that means, but <laughs> why don't you illuminate it? Yeah, so I teach at Calvin University, and it's funny because a lot of the kind of the bad guys and Jesus and John Wayne are also Calvinists, and and they kind of you know dominate the the public uh, image of Calvinism, which is you know it's not a pretty picture. And so one of the most controversial things that I do from time to time is, you know, come out as a Calvinist on social media just to remind people this is who I am. And uh, I'm still a practicing Christian, you know, attend a church down um, down the street. And um, and I think that throws people off sometimes. But my tradition does take sin very seriously. <laughs> like 
<laughs> in all kinds of ways, right? We talk about sin a lot. We have theology that helps us understand. And sin is seen as, yes, personal kind of heart orientation. And that's very much what evangelicals are all about. But it also is also seen as structural. Like for for generations, like humanity has um, been prone to you know pride and selfishness and greed, and so over time, like our society structures reflect that, and it just you know it, it snowballs. And so we understand sin as both personal, making bad choices, being selfish, and all of that, but also absolutely structural. And so it's been kind of wild to see the. Um, absolute backlash against things like systemic racism. And many conservative Christians, including from my own tradition, are just blasting that, right? These are the political talking points. You know, all of a sudden CRT is a thing and it's, it's the worst thing. And it's, and for me, I, I, you know, being rooted in a theological tradition, I can say, wait a minute. This shouldn't be a contradiction for you at all. You should be the first up to say, of course, sin brokenness, corruption is everywhere. And if it is, then we should always be looking at, you know, how do we fix that? How do we make it less bad? And our fixes are never going to be perfect, but how can we bring some healing? How can we bring some restoration? How can we do justice? Which is a very, very biblical concept. You know, what are we called to do to do justice and love kindness? So yes, that's where I come from. And that's kind of my faith tradition and the theology that shapes how I see the world. Uh, but then the book is, is really, it's, it's a work of academic history. And, um, and that's the story I had to tell. I think that is a, a great note to end on, Kristen. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. This was great. Hey, Midas Mighty, love this report? Continue the conversation by following us on Instagram, at Midas Touch, to keep up with the most important news of the day. What are you waiting for? Follow us now.